The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right, we're live. Kay, if you would like to begin. Okay, thank you, and welcome to the Charity and Security Networks webinar, IRS Audits of Nonprofits, How to Avoid or Prepare. This is May 8, 2017. This webinar is meant to help nonprofit organizations understand the Internal Revenue Services enforcement process and how it might affect your organization. It is being recorded and will be posted online so please bear that in mind when you are asking questions later or making comments. We are fortunate to have three legal experts today to describe the IRS enforcement process and give you tips on what to do to prepare or avoid uh, an audit. While our speakers are experienced legal experts, please remember that the content of this webinar is not legal advice. So with that, we'll have three speakers. I'll introduce them each as they uh, come to talk with you. The first is Lara Kalwinski, who is Senior Counsel for Compliance and Policy at the Council on Foundations. It's also Executive Director there for National Standards. She is known for her knowledge of exempt organizations, legal compliance, and project management. She has experience working with nonprofit organizations in India, Germany, Mexico, Liberia, and Ghana. She has worked with foundations to meet with state and federal regulators, manage board of directors and committee grant-making procedures, create gifts acceptance procedures, reverse program deficits, and implement community-led grant program design. She's going to describe to us, in general, the IRS uh, enforcement work plan and how uh, it focuses on audits this year. So with that, Lara, take it away. Great. Thank you, Kay, and I'm just going to try to spend one second getting the right screen up. <laughs> Here we go. All right. And you are not, I am sorry for the technical difficulty, this worked just a minute ago. Andrea, can I confirm that you cannot see my slides? I can see them. Oh, okay, great. Okay, go ahead. Great, I just couldn't see them. So as long as you can see them, that's fantastic. Hi, everyone. I'm Laura with the Council on Foundations. I'm so glad Kay did her disclaimer because now I don't have to. Um, I'd love to dive right into the IRS audit selection methodology and data-driven audits. This isn't um, something that's exciting for everyone, <laughs> and so I'm so glad to be with colleagues who might be interested in this issue. So first I want to talk about historically, or maybe not historically, but the last way that the IRS looked at audits was a risk-based approach. So the IRS focused on various types of exempt organizations when deciding whom to audit. Um, an example might be social welfare organizations or membership organizations that had big ticket raffles. Uh, we also saw a trend where the IRS would do a study, perhaps on healthcare or universities, and then after those studies, um, or in conjunction with them, be doing audits on those areas. So now the methodology is to use analytics and run them on the Form 990 data. Um, so all this talk that we've had uh, year over year about electronic filing and being able to have uh, electronic readable forms and whether those forms are available to the public um, all kind of coincides with this new methodology of using analytics. Um, as we understand, there are currently 100, around 150 different queries on the Form 990, and if an exempt organization fails or ticks too many of those queries, then they could be put in a bucket for audit. The reason that we know some of this information is that the Tax Exempt Government Entities um, Division provided us with the priorities for financial year 2016 last year. And in the message from the T Commissioner and in those priorities, um, in that priority letter, we see information about the elimination regarding the subjectivity from audit, um, auditee identification, and the idea that 
by using data-driven audits, we might cast a wider net for audits than we had in, than they had in the past, um, but perhaps not a deeper one. So again, when I link back to things like the studies or um, specific groups, um, that the IRS was maybe aware of, this data is supposed to take us away from um, sort of that more risk-based or some could say targeted, I'm sure the IRS would not approach. Um, now, while they're casting a wider net, what's interesting about that is that due to budget constraints, we're not sure how that will fall out. I will say, by looking at previous year's data, and Mark may speak on this more, that what we see is that they are not that um, the IRS is not um, necessarily going for or finding um, a reason somebody is not complying with their Form 990 or their filing status due to their international work alone. Um, there's a much more there's many more questions regarding um, the some other questions, specifically whether or not the entity actually does charitable activities. So some additional information, I won't read all these slides but so that you all have it. Um, the tax exempt government entities, key areas of focus for 2016, data driven decision making is specifically called out. Um, and then when it comes to the examinations division, um, Data-driven decision-making, again, seen as a way to work on identifying areas of non-compliance. And then perhaps the most important information we pull out regarding the audit from this letter is the five strategic issue areas. And as you can see, number four is international work um, issues, including oversight of funds spent outside of the U.S., including funds spent on potential terrorist activities. Um, you know, a lot of the information we all talk about um, in our meetings and calls together. Uh, one thing I would like to say is uh, Kay and I had a meeting with the IRS Criminal Activities Unit, Unit this year, and one thing I asked was, how is international defined? And um, they said, well, most likely cross-border. And then when I pushed and said, well, what about refugee resettlement? What about immigrant populations? Those were also recognized as areas that could um, but may not necessarily come under international. So a couple of tips for how to deal with this information and knowing that international is one of the issues that they look at. Um, you want to check your Form 990 for consistency. I've listed some ways that you can check for consistency throughout your own Form 990, but if these, incon if these pieces are inconsistent, um, that's going to be um, a, a red flag issue. Specifically, if you look at Part 4 of the Form 990, the checklist of required schedules, if you are filling that out and you have not then provided the schedules you said you were you needed to fill out in that section, that's going to be a really quick way of finding issues with your Form 990. So um, I know we're always in you know a last minute rush to get those documents in, but the checks are really important here um, when dealing with it. So, I also included um, some information and quick tips for resources that you all can educate yourselves with after this call concludes. So the Stay Exempt page of the IRS website, um, some of their training materials, their resource library, their reading room, their issue snapshots, um, when the dates are for meetings. I know that all of this may seem like too much information, like why am I not aggregating it, but I'm providing it to you because I often find that this information, I can't find it when I need it. I have these tabs all saved on my computer because they become very difficult um, to pull up when I need them. So that's why I'm providing them as part of the resources. Um, in addition, I've just tried to, tried to provide a little bit of information about the Office of the Audit and where exempt organizations lie. So under the Assistant Inspector General for Audit Management, 
services and uh, management services and exempt organizations, um, you do see sort of how the audit plan comes together within the organization. Another thing we hear from people a lot is they don't know who to talk to or how to get through to somebody um, at the IRS. One of the things the Council on Foundations does, or perhaps other groups you work with, is help you figure out who to be talking to with the contacts that we already have. Um, so I don't want to take too much time from our other fantastic speakers today, but I've given you some of the information that I called together here and my contact information if I can provide um, additional notes or information. Thank you very much, Lara. Um, mm -hmm. Extremely helpful and uh, a bit alarming to see that international activities have been listed as, as a targeted uh, area for the IRS to look into. Uh, so we'll have to uh, look at that more closely and discuss implications of that going forward. Next, uh, we have Mark Owens, a, a partner at Loeb & Loeb law firm based in D.C. But prior to entering private practice, uh, Mark Owens was employed by the Exempt Organizations Division at the IRS and served as the division's director for 10 years. He has uh, extensive experience representing nonprofit, nonprofits on a broad range of issues, including private foundations, charities, lobbying political organizations, and trade associations. Uh, so he is uh, perfectly placed to describe to us uh, basically how how this enforcement system works. So uh, with that, Mark, um, we'll be on audio only. Okay, very good, Kay. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. And following on on Lara's uh, presentation, um, the IRS uh, has made it clear that they find um, international activities of tax-exempt organizations, in this case it would be particularly charities, uh, they are the largest uh, single type of tax-exempt organization uh, to be of interest from an, an, an audit perspective. And, and while it is correct that the IRS is um, uh, making uh, changes to their audit selection process that they collectively call uh, data-driven, um, the amount of data about international activities on the Form 990 is actually relatively limited. Uh, in fact, the Form 990 uh, with regard to international activities requires less information than it does for domestic grant making. So I, I think uh, from a standpoint of, of audit selection, the IRS is probably going to be relying on secondary sources, including complaints or referrals from other government agencies. And I think that's particularly important because uh, of the concerns with um, uh, terrorist funding that tend to permeate much of the uh, government's orientation towards international activities these days. But to start off with, let, let me give you a sense of how an IRS audit uh, progresses. Um, it typically starts with a letter. Um, the IRS, uh, as a general rule, does not initiate audits with a telephone call. It certainly does not use email at, at all um, in the in the audit process. Um, the letter would uh, indicate that uh, the organization has been selected for a review. It will provide a particular year or years uh, that will be under review. It's important to know that because um, in responding to requests for information, the IRS will be asking about a discrete year um, if you volunteer information that comes from other tax years, you're doing that on your own initiative, um, and it could have consequences depending on what you provide. So looking at the letter you receive um, is important, noting the, the year involved, note the names of the revenue agent and the revenue agent's manager. Those are going to be important data points. The audit itself and indeed that first letter will probably be accompanied by something called an information document request, and it goes by the initials IDR. Um, the IRS will um, typically ask for information in writing. Uh, once the audit's underway, you may get a, you know, there may be um, oral communications 
indicating that additional information will be requested, but you should always, it should always be reduced to writing. And if it isn't, you should ask it to be reduced to writing. Um, there will be discrete questions um, asking for documents, perhaps descriptions of processes and procedures, things of that nature. Um, there will be a time period within which um, the IRS would like their response. Um, you can, if necessary, request extensions of that time, uh, and you should do so, particularly uh, in light of the fact that some of the IRS requests may be burdensome. And remember, the IRS doesn't know what your record systems are like. They don't know whether it is um, a, a resource-intensive and time-intensive effort to respond to any particular question. So you should be up front and um, let the revenue agent know if some request is going to be um, a challenge, particularly from the standpoint of the timeliness of your response. Um, the IRS um, should meet with you at the beginning of the audit. Uh, it's good to get to know who you're dealing with. Ideally, the agent's manager should be there as well, and you should note the contact information for the manager because there may be times where you want to go directly to the manager for extensions of time or uh, other kinds of, of communications. Um, and at this point, I think it's worth noting that there are um, essentially three kinds of revenue agents that you may be dealing with. Uh, one, the what I'll call the, uh, the regular or general revenue agent is uh, a, a person who typically with accounting training who um, could be assigned to um, audits of any kind of organ tax exempt organization. The fact that they have drawn, drawn your, your particular organization um, is just a, just a luck of the draw, so to speak. Um, they would be the ones who would do audits of, um, uh, of, of a routine nature. There's another kind of revenue agent, though, that has started appearing in cases involving international activities, and in part because often the, there is a link to um, uh, Office of Foreign Assets control licenses or um, uh, constraints on uh, interactions with certain foreign countries or if there's any sort of indication that there may be a concern with, uh, with the anti-terrorist practices. Um, and the kind of revenue agent who would handle those cases is called a financial uh, investigative agent. And these are revenue agents who have much more training in accounting, particularly forensic accounting, than the general agents, the regular internal revenue agents. They often support criminal investigations um, or handle more complex uh, audits. Uh, these agents are, um, are more aggressive. They are more knowledgeable. They will ask, ask uh, tougher questions. And then the third kind of revenue agent would, would actually be a, a, a criminal investigator. And chances are, if your organization is subject to a criminal investigation, um, it, there will be one of the financial investigative uh, agents assigned to your case as well. Um, IRS criminal investigators do not have, as a general rule, any particular knowledge about tax-exempt organizations, so they, their, their activities, their investigations will be supplemented with uh, assistance from the exempt organizations division. Now, whichever uh, examination whether it's a, a regular audit or uh, an audit being conducted by a financial investigative agent, it's going to proceed with a series of information document requests. Um, there will be uh, meetings or telephone calls to talk about the status of the case periodically, and the revenue agents are asked to um, keep the taxpayer up to date on uh, the way things are going, whether are there any issues uh, arising? Um, if issues do arise and uh, there is no clear guidance on a particular issue, there is a, an informal and a formal process for the revenue agent to get assistance from IRS counsel. 
Uh, the informal assistance uh, you may or may not be aware of because it's not uh, a process in which the taxpayer participates, but there is a more formal process called technical advice where the taxpayer is informed of the particular issue, the particular facts, and the relevant law, um, and the request for technical advice goes into the uh, national office of the IRS to the office of chief counsel where there's a, uh, a right to uh, a conference, to a hearing essentially um, before that you know, group in Washington. And then the answer to the technical question is provided to the revenue agent and eventually a copy of the response gets to the taxpayer as well. So the audit proceeds in that fashion. Um, at some point, the agent will uh, be through with fact gathering and with the analysis, there'll be a meeting at which the agent will present his or her tentative findings. Uh, if they're favorable to the organization, that'll be the end of the discussion. You'll get a, 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 a no change letter or a letter with some suggestion about record keeping uh, changes or something of that nature. If the issue is, is potentially adverse to the taxpayer, um, you'll be told uh, what the issue is. There'll be a, an informal discussion of the issue and the agent's concerns. You have a right to push back, to submit um, uh, additional information. And if you are unable to persuade the revenue agent of the correctness of the organization's position, there's a right to appeals, um, to a hearing before the IRS Office of Appeals, which is a separate function within the agency. And um, that hearing will be, in essence, a de novo review. In other words, the appeals officer will not have had discussions with the revenue agent about the case. Um, you will have a right to a, a, a conference, a telephonic conference with IRS appeals. And then at the end of that conference, the appeals officer will either um, uh, discuss a, a, a negotiated resolution of your case. They may hold against the revenue agent, in which case um, uh, the audit is over. Or if they hold against the taxpayer, um, they will so state and you will uh, eventually get a uh, an action letter, if you will, which could be uh, revocation of tax exemption or assessment of particular taxes such as unrelated business income tax. Um, the, um, after that final letter, the next stop to challenge that action would be in court. Um, for exemption issues, there are, uh, for charities with exemption issues, there are essentially three courts that you can go to, uh, tax court, U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia, or the Court of Federal Claims. Um, and those would be the area, the, the courts in which exemption issues would be challenged. Um, issues involving unrelated business income tax or other kinds of excise taxes would have to be challenged through what's called refund litigation uh, or, or else in, uh, uh, in, in tax court. So that's a, a quick overview of the, the audit process. And, um, be happy to take questions after we're through the presentations. Thank you. Well, and it really helps give us a, a context for what the overall process is so that we can consider uh, what to do to avoid uh, getting audited if there are things we can do. And then if that happens internally, how to respond. And to uh, speak to us about that, we have Alex Reed. Uh, an attorney at Morgan Lewis Law Firm in D.C. Uh, Alex advises tax exempt organizations in planning, structuring, and transactional matters, represents taxpayers under audit, uh, so he has direct experience here, and helps organizations improve their governance and enhance tax compliance. Um, with that, uh, I will turn it over to Alex to uh, get, help us figure out what to do, how to avoid being audited, and then what to do if if that should occur. Thank you. Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us, and, and thank you to Laura and Mark for, uh, for, for your comments. I'll, I'll just echo some of those and emphasize others, and, um, and then we'll be happy to, to take questions. Um, 
So the question about who gets picked for audit, and that's of course the the biggest one, and it's a, it's it's a hard uh, hard question to answer. Um, in the tax world, we call it the audit lottery uh, because the it's a it is a, a random um, probability whether your return will be picked or not. Um, there are ways to, I suppose, increase or decrease the odds that your return will be picked. Um, and uh, the main, the main thing that you can do, and uh, this seems obvious, but it's it's really worth uh, emphasizing, is um, filing a return. <laughs> a lot of organizations uh, will think, oh, I, you know. Uh, I can't get around to it, or I'm, I'm having a change in um, in control. The the secretary who used to be on the board of the organization is no longer there, and we haven't appointed his or her replacement yet. And so, um, you know, we'll we'll catch up next year. Um, it's really important to file the return, and of course, to file it in a in a complete uh, fashion, so that you you fill out all the schedules and, and all the boxes that are necessary because um, you want to start the statute of limitations. Um, the first issue that we as attorneys will look at if there's an audit is has the statute of limitations run on the issue under the audit. So, um, so that's, a, that's a key thing. In order to start that statute of limitations running, which bars the government from um, asserting that there was a, a, a failure to comply or a failure to pay tax. Um, if you file the return, generally you have three years until the statute has run. If you um, file a return but it's incomplete in a material fashion, there's not enough information on that return to allow the government to discern the facts that are relevant to uh, figuring out the issue that they're, that they're focused on then the statute of limitations is six years, generally. And if you don't file a return, there is no statute of limitations. It, it just it never starts running. And so, um, so it's really important. The best, the most important thing you can do is make sure you file your return every year and make sure that it's complete. Okay, so that's, that's a fairly uh, straightforward thing that you can do. Um, another key item, we've talked a lot about this new approach that we're all concerned about, uh, which is the data analytics. Um, so there was a team at the IRS in the large business and international division that focused on uh, collecting data from large uh, company returns and using that data, running it through a, a smart computer algorithm to select uh, returns for audit. Um, that project has been successful in the large business area, and they've now um, allowed that team access to the exempt orgs division. So they are using some of the algorithms that they developed in that other context and have been polling uh, revenue agents for, quote unquote, the issues that keep them up at night uh, to create these computer algorithms to read your return and uh, make some preliminary recommendations to IRS agents for, uh, for which returns should be picked. Uh, we don't know what those algorithms say. Um, we do know that algorithms in general are going to look at data um, uh, more than they are going to look at words because words are difficult to translate into an algorithm. Not impossible, but, but difficult. Um, so as Lara mentioned, I think um, failing to file a schedule when you've checked a box that would indicate that you need to file a schedule, um, that would probably be something that the algorithm would pick up. Unclear whether the algorithm is going to search your Schedule F, which is the statement of activities outside the United States, for keywords like, I don't know, Yemen or Syria or um, other countries where there are um, particular concerns about um, terrorist activities. Um, it's, it's totally possible that they will, um, but yeah, we don't know for sure whether it's But in any case, you'll need to complete that schedule if it's asked for. And again, going back to the first point, the best thing you can do is start the statute of limitations running 
on um, on your on your form. So uh, fill it out and fill it out timely and file it. Um, the Schedule F. Um, <coughs> We're not familiar with it. Generally, asks about your activities in a region. I'm, I have it here, in my my handy binder of all the relevant schedules to the Form 990, and it talks about you have to list the region, the number of offices you have in the region, the number of employees, agents, and independent contractors you have. Um, there's a, a box for the activities you conduct in the region by type, including fundraising, program services, namely charitable services that you render in that country, um, uh, investments, grants to recipients located in the region. And then if you list an activity, uh, then you need to describe the specific type of service that you do there, and then the total expenditures in that region. Uh, the second part lists grants, and you have to list any grant to any recipient who receives more than $5,000. Under that amount doesn't go on this on this schedule. So five thousand dollars is the the cutoff per recipient. Um, and then there's uh, part four has a list of, of foreign forms that you'll need to to complete anytime you transfer um, property to a foreign corporation. You have to complete a form nine twenty six. This is actually more for for income tax purposes than it is for um, Policing charitable activities, making sure that the amount of, uh, of income, U.S. income tax, is properly collected. Um, there's also a, a supplemental information schedule with where you can uh, provide description in words of um, of any information that would help an agent understand the information that you've that you put in part one or two. So again, the key to, to, to uh, cutting off the statute of limitations is including sufficient information to enable an agent to understand the issue. And um, as we said, the algorithms may pick up some words. It's unclear exactly what they, what they will do. They're probably going to be looking more at numbers and boxes that you've checked. So um, the, in an abundance of caution, we often recommend that if you have an issue that is complicated um, and requires a lot of, of um, discussion, to go ahead and fill it out in a paragraph description of, of what that issue is, um, either in Part 5 of your Schedule F or it might go on Schedule O of your 990, which is the, the schedule of just supplemental information. Then you've fulfilled your obligation to give the information that you need, uh, that the government needs to adjudicate the issue, um, and it's all on on the return. If they if they don't look at it in the statute of limitations period, that's that's their problem. Um, so those are some some preliminary thoughts. Um, other things that you can do, um, you know, it, we as as Mark mentioned. Um, if another governmental agency um, has a complaint about an organization, they can refer it to the IRS. And we do certainly see a lot of, of audits driven that way. It's kind of an unfortunate thing because uh, the media can really uh, gin up public outrage that um, may or may not be fair or warranted. And uh, that can prompt a politically minded agency or government um, political appointee, et cetera, to pick that organization and say, hey, IRS, you really should go after them. The media can't do it. They don't have standing to do it. Individuals and other uh, non-governmental organizations can't pick uh, and tell the IRS who to audit. But um, the IRS itself can do that, and they tend to be uh, uh, sensitive uh, to, to media reports just as a uh, as any political appointee would. So, so that's something to bear in mind. The more public scrutiny you get, the, there is an increased audit risk as a result of that. Um, there is a whistleblower procedure, um, but where a, a, an ordinary citizen can file a whistleblower complaint and uh, the IRS may or may not act upon it. Um, 
but you won't, you won't know because uh, audits are taxpayer confidential information. So the IRS won't tell the whistleblower, hey, we are prosecuting your complaint. Um, but people do can and do file those whistleblower complaints about other organizations. Um, let's see. So another thing that you can do to uh, to prepare is to conduct um, an internal audit, a, a self audit, to make sure that um, you know if it's pretty common that an accounting firm will be preparing your 990. And they may or may not have a lot of uh, interaction with the rest of the board and the, the people who, who govern the organization. They might just be um, communicating with just one person, um, filling out the 990 based on that, and they may not have all of the information that is, is needed. And so um, what you can do to help that is, of course, communicate with your uh, return preparers to give them all that information that you need but also um, to internally investigate your organization to make sure that if you have a policy that you're in compliance with it, if you, um, that all of the things that you say on the 990 are in fact true, you want to review that, that 990, you want to see that um, your governing documents are consistent and up to date with the way that you currently operate. You don't want to have um, board members who are not properly uh, uh, elected um, because the, the procedures in the bylaws weren't followed uh, for, for appointing those directors. Um, you want to make sure that the Form 1023 application that you someone in your organization filed perhaps years and years and years ago, that document is what the IRS understands your organization to be doing. And so if you have drifted from the 1023 application that you originally submitted, you should uh, update the IRS about how things may have changed um, and review internally to see, gosh, have we had a mission creep? Have we, are we comfortable with where we've gone since our original application? Um, and then look back at the IRS determination letter to make sure that you're uh, still operating within that. Um, again, this has a, an important audit component because the Form 1023 application that you gave to the IRS is your explanation and justification for why you are within 501c3. And so if you disclosed it on that original application and the IRS confirmed and granted you a determination letter on the basis of the information that you provided, um, it is more difficult for uh, an IRS agent on audit to say uh, that we have a problem with this activity, you can say, well, look, I told you I was going to do this activity in my original application, and you approved it. And so that kind of shifts the presumption um, that if it was approved and disclosed, that it's permitted. Um, so that tends to be a pretty compelling argument in, in the audit context. Um, so. Um, we talked a little bit about issue areas. Um, you know, setting aside the more uh, media-sensitive stuff and the more politically motivated stuff that may or may not come up, um, the IRS itself tends to be focused on revenue generation. And so they, a lot of the audits that exempt organizations receive tend to focus on areas where exempt organizations are responsible for collecting and paying taxes over to the government, as you might imagine. So in particular, the employment area um, are, are your employees, are the, the people that you pay compensation for services, are they employees, in which case you need to be filing W-2s, or are they independent contractors, in which case you file 1099s. And if you're filing W-2s, you need to be collecting payroll taxes. So those, those payroll tax audit issues, um, it, it's, it's rare to find an organization that has not made some sort of error in its um, payment of compensation for services, employee classification. Um, are you paying someone as a contractor that really should be an employee? Um, and you know, it's, a, it's an easy way for the IRS to collect some, um, some money, and they do. 
Um, likewise, in the international context, uh, foreign withholding is, is really a big area where you pay compensation uh, for services uh, to a non-resident alien, and those services are rendered in the United States, so they are U.S. source income, but you don't withhold on the payment of compensation to that non-resident alien. And you, if, you, if you fail to withhold and file the right uh, information returns with the IRS, you, the, or the U.S. non-governmental organization that is paying the compensation, you are responsible for the tax. And the tax is 30% of the payment. Um, this is the foreign withholding tax area, and it's another very common uh, area for, for audits. Um, it's something to, to make sure that you, it's complicated and tricky to do correctly, but something that you really need to be sure that you're on top of because it uh, is an area of exposure for, for a lot of organizations. Um, again, it's not a separate tax. It is a withholding tax that the non-resident alien really, they're the one who owes it to the U.S. government. But because the U.S. government doesn't have a lot of uh, jurisdiction over that foreign individual because they're not a U.S. citizen and don't ordinarily file an income tax return, um, the, the presumption shifts to the payor. The IRS says you, the payor, are responsible for collecting the tax that that, pay, that, that payee, the service provider, uh, owes to the U.S. government. And so you kind of get to be a deputy IRS agent uh, collecting that tax, paying it over to the government, and if you neglect to discharge your duties correctly, the government will, will tax you. So that's, uh, I think, probably the, one of the largest areas of noncompliance besides um, worker classification is foreign withholding tax uh, noncompliance. Um, so take a, take a close look at that. Um, and if you have questions or issues, and I'm sure you will because this is really quite complicated, is when is a U.S. source, when is the payee a non-resident alien or not, uh, make sure that you get uh, good advice on that. Um, just make a couple more points before we turn it over for, for questions. Uh, I see Kay has appeared on the screen, perhaps, uh, to, to make a comment. Um, I'll just, just mention, um, Mark did a great job of, of um, giving an overview of the, um, the audit process, the, the initial contact that the IRS agents will, will reach out to you, and, and the uh, IDRs, information document requests. One, one thing I just want to really underline for you is what happens right after that initial contact. There's an opportunity to, uh, to really expedite the resolution of your audit by having your meeting with the, with the audit team and really making your case. Um, you can spare a lot of heartache and pain down the road if in your initial meeting you come prepared with a full description of, uh, of your position on the case and your explanation. I, I find with NGO, with nonprofit clients, uh, the story is very, usually a very good one and the reason for any kind of a, um, uh, of, a, of a failure or, or uh, you know, the reason for any kind of noncompliance is a misunderstanding or a small oversight. And so um, you want to be able to put that into context and talk about the great stuff that your organization does and why there might have been a mistake and, and uh, explain all of that because if you don't, if you kind of play the uh, wait and see game, you know, oh, maybe they'll just go away, maybe it'll um, turn into nothing. <coughs> that can really draw things out and lead to a much, much, much longer process where people get uh, dug in on issues and they're just gonna, they're gonna push until they find something, even if they're, what they're pushing with is the wrong concept. So, um, so get it right at the beginning um, to, to situate the audit properly and, um, and you can get a better resolution. So Kay, I'll, I'll turn it back to you now and um, we can have questions. Okay. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, while none of this sounds like fun for an organization, it also sounds like something uh, that can be handled uh, and that 
the question is uh, how to be best prepared. Um, so thank you to all three of you. At, at this point, we want to open it up for questions and comments. And I have my uh, colleague, Andrea Hall, will describe the, the process. Hi, everyone. Um, if you see a dashboard on your screen that is provided by the GoToWebinar service, um, you'll see that there are several gray bars sharing audio, dashboard, et cetera. And there's one called Questions. If you click on the little triangle to the left of questions, it will open up the question pane, and you can type your question there. Um, if you have uh, an experience to share or a lengthier comment, let us know in that question pane, and we can unmute your microphone if you'd like to speak. Um, you can also detach the pane from that dashboard if it's easier for you to type in a bigger space by using the little box off to the right of the word, where it says questions. If you look over to the right, there's a little box with an arrow in it and that will bring the question pane up in a bigger space. So it looks like we have two questions so far. Kay, do you want to take those? OK. Uh, the first one is, generally speaking, how focused is the IRS on auditing charities for potentially exceeding their living limits or for uh, impermissible electioneering? Would any of our speakers like to tackle that? It's certainly been. Uh, a controversial issue in the past. Well, this is Mark. Perhaps I could simply observe that um, reviewing uh, lobbying activity and reviewing political campaign activity uh, is a standard issue area in any IRS audit, uh, regardless of how it was initiated, whether it was data-driven or a complaint. Um, revenue agents will, um, will, will ask about those sorts of questions. Uh, those sorts of issues. The only exception would be a, uh, a limited scope examination. For example, one focusing on employment taxes probably would not get into political or lobbying activity. But if it's a, a, a more general audit, um, you should expect the IRS agent to certainly review those areas. And if it appears there is lobbying activity or campaign activity, the agent will ask about them to ascertain the nature of the, the activity, whether it really is lobbying or really is political campaign intervention, and if so, what, what, uh, what the size and scope is. I add there that the lobbying activity is permissible, subject to, so if they ask, but that doesn't mean you're caught doing something wrong. Uh, the partisan electionary, on the other hand, is not. Uh, That's right, except, except for private foundations, which can engage in, 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 in lobbying activity. Okay. Uh, there's a, another question. What is the estimated number of Forms 990 that the IRS receives every year? Is, do we know that? Just, is that information? I just that. Yeah, that's about 1.7 million. <laughs> that's that's a lot. the number filed. <laughs> For yeah, international never... activities, as, as Alex mentioned, that requires a Schedule F to be filed with the Form 990. And in our recent research on financial access for U.S. nonprofits, we got uh, the pool of organizations that had filed Schedule F for fiscal year 14, and there were 8,665 of them. So that is a much smaller uh, pool yeah. subset. Uh, and the 1.7 million. Uh, does for our other speakers, I ask you: Does the fact that groups that do international work is uh, such a small slice of the nonprofit sector? Does this increase the overall likelihood of audit? Well, it's this is Mark again. It, it's hard to know because the IRS. Um, is fairly limited in the number of audits it actually can undertake in any given year. And historically, that number, uh, they report a number of for returns whose examinations have closed in each fiscal year in the IRS data book. But an organization typically files more than one type of return. Um, it's, it's possible the IRS does as few as 3,000 audits a year of discrete organizations. Mm -hmm. And so if they're going to actually 
be selecting organizations based on international activities. That's a smaller pool, uh, and, and indeed the audit uh, risk might be larger. I just wanted to comment on that. And it's, it's, uh, it's a lottery. Right. There, there, yeah, it's a lottery. There, there's a, a real issue right now, which is the funding of the IRS um, has been in decline, um, which makes it very difficult for the IRS to um, increase the number of audits. Uh, this is part of the reason why they've, they've uh, undertaken this streamlining procedure. They used to do more um, audits, in-person audits, where they would come to your orders and go through documents there. Um, they're doing more correspondence and correspondence audits and, and issue-specific audits to kind of tick uh, a lot of organizations off the list quickly in a narrow way rather than um, you know, opening it up to a, to a larger, um, larger audit. So um, I think that that's partly motivated by uh, cost-cutting concerns, and uh, it'll be important to watch um, as the budget negotiations in Congress proceed and as new personnel are appointed to, um, and we still have a, we still have appointed to the IRS and Treasury, we still have a legacy Obama commissioner of the IRS, and we have no um, appointees in the tax policy positions at Treasury yet. Um, once we do, they would be the ones who would be likely to advocate or not uh, for increasing the, the budget to the IRS. So that's something to watch. Just one more note on that, Kay, before we go into the next question. Um, I have a breakdown for the fiscal year 2016 examination results. Um, and as Mark said, yes, uh, as the budget continues to get cut, this number will whittle down. But total examinations in fiscal year 2016 were 4,984. Um, the two big buckets were under the filing itself and employment tax issues. Those two together make up about 3,400 of the total 4,900. Um, and then there's a sprinkling of discontinued operations, a private benefit, um, political, legislative, and government activity, and unrelated business income tax. And then we also have in fiscal year 2016 um, final reg um, revocations. Um, and, and again, Mark mentions that, that this is just those that concluded that year. Um, not operating for exempt purpose, there were 28 inurement or private benefit had six. And then there were um, nine in sort of the other category. So of those 4,900, we get 43 um, final revocations, although I'm not, I guess to Mark's point, I'm not, I can't say that those 43 necessarily came from the subset that were examined in that year as opposed to a previous year. The, the next question notes that uh, an IRS audit can be very costly for uh, an organization. And um, how, how is this justified using donor money for uh, answering the audit? Um, I guess we're assuming the IRS is not going to um, object. But uh, how do you respond to donors or others who may object to the administrative cost? Well, I think, um, I mean, it's a, it's a good question. It's, if you think of what the IRS is doing as um, making sure that the sector runs appropriately um, and that donors' money is well spent, um, I think that that is a, an appropriate response to a, to a, a donor that, um, you know, look, the, the IRS is making sure that your money is going to a good cause. And, and, um, and so, com you know, compliance is, is an administrative component of, of what we do. Um, but in terms of how to uh, minimize the cost of responding to an IRS audit, which is a real management decision, um, you know, you, you have a, a, a couple of, of options. One option is to try to handle it yourself. Another option is to try to uh, have your accountants and uh, return preparers handle it. Third option is to hire counsel 
and when do you do that? Um, I, I would encourage you to consider doing that earlier rather than later. It's actually easier to um, respond to questions later after if counsel has come in and kind of helped you figure out um, which issues are, are likely to lead to, to real problems and which issues are probably going to be uh, dead ends that, that won't have much of an impact on the organization. They find where there's exposure, focus on that and get your story right on that so that you can explain it in a coherent way to the, to the agent. And then later, if it's just a matter of routine compliance with document requests and that sort of thing, um, you may be able to, to handle that on your own or with um, with your uh, accountants. But I, I do recommend getting counsel involved at, uh, at the outset. I don't know if, if others have views on that, too. I have a couple of practical points. Um, so not being uh, senior counsel of the Council on Foundation for a minute, but being the executive director of a national standards, the self-regulation program um, that we have at the council. We ask for audits once assets reach $5 million at a foundation, and if it's under $5 million, a financial review, which is a little bit more than just an accountant checking the books. Um, so there's an interim step of this financial review that can be undertaken um, that sort of gets you on the way to an audit if you feel smaller. When it comes to the question about donor dollars and how they can be spent and administrative expenses versus program expenses, and I understand um, that people deal with that ratio um, question a lot, the expenses we're doing to prove you do good work well, um, while they are administrative costs, uh, donors wouldn't have a claim that you, well, Mark, I'll let you speak to that. But the idea that if a donor gave an unrestricted gift and then um, was upset or tried to make a claim that that money should have been used for a specific purpose um, would not be as strong as if the donor had designated the gift to a certain purpose. So the donor can have concerns, um, but hopefully your balance in your annual reporting of what programs you undertook, and then how you ensured you were compliant with the laws that allow you to run those programs um, would be a good combination. Yes, this is we Mark. only have I, a question. Uh, Mark, oh, sorry, did you want to No, that's fine. Uh, we're running short of time, so. Okay, well, I just wanted to ask each of you uh, if you have any final thoughts that you'd like to share before we close and may go in the order in which you spoke. So start with Lara. Um, I'd just like to point out if any of you um, are having particular issues with audit or uh, regulations, the Council on Foundations regularly talks to Treasury and IRS, and we will submit priority guidance. And if you need things in there, please reach out and, and be in touch with Kay or myself. Mark? Um, uh, this is Mark. Um, I, I guess my, my final thought is that um, it's important to treat um, every IRS interaction as an important one. Um, and uh, there, there are, you know, there are uh, risks to failing to pay uh, attention to what's going on. And um, so you don't want to create a, a problems for your organization down the road. So it's important to stay on top of any IRS interactions. And Alex? I would echo the comments of my colleagues here. Um, um, uh, don't be penny wise and sound foolish. Um, and uh, maybe in response partially to that last question, um, you know, even if uh, uh, the likelihood of getting picked is um, remote under the law, you can uh, consider budgeting for um, self-audit and actual audit as part of your um, administrative budget. Set aside some funds um, each year, and then um, if and when you have an IRS audit or decide to undertake a self-audit, you'll have a budget already there to to account for it, rather than having to make a big ask to donors in a particular year. Well, thank you all. 
the Cherry and Security Network will be monitoring uh, how this new approach to audits from the risk-based approach to the data-driven analysis approach, how that seems to be working out, uh, and see if there are concerns about over-targeting uh, groups that do international work. Uh, certainly, the fact that a group does international work doesn't necessarily, by definition, mean that that group is a higher risk than any other. So we will be keeping an eye on that. Uh, if you have experiences or along those lines that you, uh, if you get calls or you hear of groups that are being uh, audited and it appears to be politically driven or otherwise, uh, please let us know because we will be tracking that. Um, so I want to thank you all again. Uh, this webinar and the PowerPoint will be posted online before long and we encourage you to share it with your colleagues, your grantees, uh, your members. And, and also to come to our website, charityandsecurity.org, and join, donate, sign up, and participate. So thank you all. Thanks, Joanne.